Welcome to my world. I'm Jazz Takar, and I want you to come follow me on my journey as I document the ups and downs of running a business. I've been in sales and service for over 25 years. See, my cup's full now. It's my time to give back to you. The conversations I'm having with guys and gals in the industries of real estate, entrepreneurship, and leadership. Make sure to subscribe, like, comment, and all you have to do now is sit back, relax, and come into my world. Thanks for being in the REC experience. I'm your host, Jazz Tackar, with your girl, Laura Elto Stewart. How are you doing? I'm good. I got my fall get up on you today. Do. I'm do. ready for the cold, I which know. has come upon us very quickly. Do you have to throw it in our face? Like we were, we're doing for like it's still kind of warm. I've, I've been prepared, preparing for this since like early August. Okay. Really? Yeah. That... I know what's coming. I know what's coming. Well, you, uh, for our listeners, you can't <laughs> see this, but Laura has her Band-Aid jacket on, as we call it. <laughs> yeah. It does look like one, but how you been, Laura? I'm good, I'm good. I know Rudy is uh, uh, going into surgery, him being him. Rudy, this is Laura's dog for all of you guys that oh, yes. have, have just joined us, but how's everything with Rudy? Well, Rudy's going in for surgery today, surgery number two. Yeah. He tore his equivalent ACL on his other leg now, so within an 11-month period, he's having two surgeries, and he's costing me a lot of money. So yeah. nice. Yeah. Or well, just crazy like his mom. <laughs> he's crazy like his mom. What can I say? Wow. I'm very, very <laughs> excited to introduce our guest today, Mr. Alex Stern. How are you doing today, Alex? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, no surgeries required. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have any uh, I uh my uh, sidekick uh uh, dog bandit just passed, but uh, oh, we had so nine, nine, nine great years and uh, un un unexpected uh, brain tumor. So, oh no, I'm sorry yeah, so uh, so uh, so I'm uh, gonna be seeking uh, a, a new companion soon. So, nice, nice. Well, Alec, I mean, you, you you're really all over the place in terms of uh, uh, social media as well as. Um, uh, the seminars and workshops and events you put on. Just for some of our, our, our listeners and viewers, um, I always like to take people back kind of like your comic. If, if we were writing a comic book, what, what, what would be your backstory? <laughs> uh, uh, listen, anything with comedy I'm in. So, <laughs> uh, uh, so backstory. Well, uh, my entrepreneurial journey started when I was, I think, seven or eight. Um, wow. You know, we were provided for as a family, but you know, if there was, if we wanted certain things, you know, we'd always, I'd always hear, uh, well, we don't have the money for it. And so I, I just started, you know, just doing whatever I can to make money in the neighborhood. And as I got a little bit older into, you know, uh, my, my early teens, I was commanding the neighborhood for uh, uh, cutting grass, shoveling snow, detailing cars, and just a handyman, you know, for, for the families in the neighborhood. And and then I started hiring on, uh, you know, younger kids to help me do the job. So I was doing six, eight driveways at a time, you know, to shovel and their sidewalks with all these other kids helping and I get paid and pay them. And so, um, so most of it was to save up for those things that I was told I couldn't have. And, and then of course I had a big wad of cash and convinced my dad to take me down to the store to buy a moped and which my mom was dead set against. And, She's standing on the porch with her arms crossed, telling me I got to, you know, as I'm driving by, beeping the horn, like, get over here. I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> I, could, I could convince my dad to do anything and uh, against whatever she would say. Um, and, of course, I pulled in the driveway, and she, she pulled it in the garage and put a lock on it. And it took a week to convince her to let me ride it again. And I told her I, I, it's safe. Nothing's going to happen. Of course, I went over the handlebars and got all cut up and, yeah, so you know, moms are always right. But the bottom line is, uh, I, that was my I got my chops. I got my chops on uh, you know being an entrepreneur, and and then it carried it forward uh, till uh, after college, just jumping in. I jumped into a big company, and then I uh, was invited by someone who was many levels above to hey, want to come to this startup that some other folks in the company had started, and you know I I, I didn't quite quite really grasp what that meant. But, but I had a lot of book of business uh, sitting there that I wanted to do with my current company. And I said, well, let me think about it. So a couple of months later, I closed some of that business. I went back and revisited. And they couldn't guarantee me I was going to get paid in six months or if I'd even have a job in six months or if they'd even be in business in six months. You know, they were just, you know, painting the startup picture. Mm -hmm. And I joined. And five years to the day, we went public. And I'm like, this piece uh -huh. of paper is worth what? 
<laughs> yeah, so I didn't quite grasp it. I'm like, how do I do this again? So eight companies later, you know, two IPOs and three acquisitions, I, uh, I got this startup bug and either being a founder or on the founding team, so. I got to say, we, we hear a lot from people, once they've gotten started, they get hooked. But I got to ask, like, what got you to take that first leap of faith the very first time? Because like you said, you weren't going to have any money. You weren't guaranteed anything, really. Like, how do you get past that? I'm sure there was a part of you that was quite fearful to make that move. Yeah. And in fact, it was a three month hesitation. You know, I was fearful for sure. I, you know, imagine having multi millions in potential sales that I could be closing and mm -hmm. potentially getting zero in six months, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was daunt it was a daunting sort of thing, but uh, the person who was many levels above uh, um, that I, I, I uh, gained respect for, for, for being successful in se selling and we got close, you know, cause I had pulled him into some of the real strategic deals that I was involved with. And so we built a relationship and I, I trusted him and I really liked, uh, I, I really wanted to work for him and with him. So there was some drivers that were outside of sort of the business itself. And I guess I just said, you know, I'm, I got to take a chance. You know, I, I was nine years into that first, first company and it was, I, I was sort of wanting to make a move. I didn't quite know, you know, kind of, it was the startup thing, you know, uh, kind of got to be a smart move or not, but you know, I, I, I'm a risk taker, you know, and, uh, and I just honestly just felt, uh, what do I have to lose? I, I know I'm good at, I, I know I'm good at what I do. I can always get another job with a bigger company if I, if I had to go do it. And, and I had others, you know, asking me if I'd come work for them, you know, people leave and move on and they want, you know, want you to go with them. So I said, I have nothing to lose. And what once I jumped it? in, yeah, I, it was, you know, it was an, it was an amazing ride. And I, you know, I just, I got to do so much more than just a job. You know, when you're, when you join a startup, you wear a lot of hats and, <laughs> and uh, you know, you get to, you get to, you know, flap your wings in a lot of ways you, you normally wouldn't if you just were pigeonholed into a job, uh, you know, with a big company, so. What, what was the first startup, Alec? What, 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 kind, what kind of company was it? Was it a tech company or? Yeah, so, so my, uh, most of my career is tech, uh, okay. you know, for, for all the startups. Um, the first one was, uh, it was actually, uh, we know we knew that relational databases at the time were, you know, uh, uh, Oracle, Informix, Sybase. We were the fourth Got it. Uh, fourth that no one knew, but, but we, it was called VMark software. And so we actually uh, created a post relational database that small uh, uh, people would write applications for small businesses. So it, it allowed to have a smaller footprint in terms of hardware and software it was less expensive. And it, it was like this mini computer uh, uh, formation, you know, spun out of the founding, you know, company was prime computer for mini computers. And this was a group that left, to go on to figure out how to put a database on top of those that that class of computers. So instead of big mainframes and or desktop computers, it sort of sat in the middle. And so so it was perfect to be able to sell to small businesses or or applications that were going to run for small businesses. That was the first time I, I really was passionate about the you know the target market, you know, helping Main Street small businesses with applications um, or divisions of larger companies. So it was so it was uh, it was an interesting, interesting, um, uh, you know, uh, an unknown, if you will, you know, being the fourth of these three giants that everyone knew and had a big marketing budget that we didn't have, but, but we were able to attract a lot of people to write, you know, their applications onto the platform. It's interesting because most people would say, well, there's already three major players, right? And, and for you guys to jump into something where there already were major players, how much fear was around that like oh my god we're getting into a marketplace that's already owned by such yeah most such people a, think they need to come up with like some a new like idea. idea something yeah. that's really yeah different that doesn't exist but obviously that's not necessarily the case I, well, I mean, so i was gonna say maybe alex speak to the fact that you've got to do something well like you don't have to be first at it it's right. obviously advantageous to be first i.e an uber or, or a facebook or something like that but that doesn't mean that there's not space for other players so I've actually done both and I, you know, I, I don't know the statistic, but I always, this is my own personal statistic. Okay. 85% of the time, you know, businesses that are launching or a product or service that's already out there, but that, that there's just, they're changing features or they're executing on it better. So there's always room in an existing market to disrupt what people are doing. Cause everyone's just saying, well, that's how, that's how we do it. Or that's how the product works. It doesn't have to, that's not the answer. I have several products that I've created 
you know, have gone on to do some physical products through manufactured metals and stuff where we saw markets that were existing with large, you know, $5 billion market, many competitors, but just hadn't been disrupted in a long time. And I could give you a few examples uh, if you want, but then 15, 15% of the time, it's something that didn't exist. You mentioned Uber and Airbnb. Mm -hmm. And I've been there too with constant contact, you know, on the founding team. Yeah. We were, we were, you know, three of us in an attic with a vision to uh, level the playing field for small businesses against big competitors. Well, the big competitors had enterprise tools, they had agencies, they had marketing staff, and they had all the help they needed. Main Street small business had nothing. And so we set out to level that playing field and give them the, you know, the first small business digital marketing tool, i.e. email marketing, you know, back, back when there wasn't even SaaS, software as a service. <laughs> Yeah. We had to install it. We had this going to date myself. We had to install a CD into a computer to use use it initially, and then we were one of the first SaaS applications. Yeah. The dial-up. You'd hear the dial-up. Yeah. yeah, right. There wasn't there wasn't a bunch of cards in a box that we had to you know put through the computer. We're not that old here, but yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, in terms of in terms of when you were speaking about like getting into a startup and wearing a lot of hats. I have a business partner. We're the co-founders here. We've always worn a lot of hats, but Laura joined us as our director of sales and marketing. That just happens to be one of the hats she wears. That's one of the titles. Yeah, one like. of the titles. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I've dubbed her the chief of staff now for me. And there's just, there's just a long list of names and, and titles. I, I, I'm, I'm sensing the dynamic. I know who, I know who's, who's behind the scenes doing all. You know, well, hold, on, hold on, hold on. I got to show you this because you said it. My clipboard in case anyone forgets. Boss. <laughs> okay. I'm the real boss. Well, she likes to remind everyone about that. <laughs> yeah, so so just subtly in the interviews, you just got to have to kind of do one of these. <laughs> <laughs> just in case. Yeah. And, and just in case people forget. Yeah. Just in case, well, I think she's making sure that I don't forget or Seamus doesn't forget. Um, but the fact that we've had the, the ability to find someone like Laura who's able to wear a lot of hats, she's obviously really helped develop a culture in what we still think we're a startup. Like, we do approximately, we help up probably close to 700 buyers, sellers, and investors every year in the GTA, Greater Toronto Area. We have 34 realtors. We have 10 support staff. Um, we're probably in and around, like a little, slightly under uh, uh, four and a half million in kind of revenues um, with all the stuff that we're up to here. So we're still very much in startup mode, and I kind of like it. Um, but speak to culture. Like, how did you go about developing culture? What did you see? What's your experience? The importance? Or maybe you might say, look, Jazz, at the end of the day, you need people, Jazz and Laura, you need people who just work. Like, what's the dynamic for you? Yeah, so so uh, um, culture is critical. Um, I can't emphasize it. Uh, uh, well, critical is a big enough word to emphasize that it's, that it's <laughs> important. Uh, but, uh, but, but it's, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's the lifeblood of a company and it's what keeps the company um, you know, aligned and, and, and you know, uh, uh, synergistic and moving forward. And, and so one of the things um, is, is just kind of what are, what are the, the, the principles that, the guiding principles of the business that everyone follows. So for example, delight the customer, you know, was our number one thing in several of our companies, right? If we're not delighting the customer, you know, you're only as good as your last engagement with a customer you know, if, uh, if it's a service or you're only as good as that, you know, um, that last customer that, that bought your product, your best prospect is your current customer because their sphere of influence of telling others for referrals. And so the bottom line is delight the customer is like the number one thing. And they had to, you know, people had to have a passion for our target market. And in, in several companies, small businesses was the, was the target market. So, so I would do a lot of interviews that I had no influence on whether we're going to hire the person or not. But they asked me to do the interviews to just check and see if they're like a good culture fit. And, and I, you know, like, like, Hey, meet a founder of, you know, different companies, you know, want to, you know, have any questions, you know? And so I'd say, look, I have, I uh, just, we're going to spend some time and I'll answer any questions that you have. I don't have any say in whether you get this job or not, but we're just going to talk for a little bit. And if you're good with that. And they're like, yeah, and, you know, I'd love to ask you some questions. It's so great to meet you, blah, blah, blah. So we get in the conversation. I'm like, so when, you know, like when, when you shop, what, what's your, what's your, go to when you're shopping. I'm too busy. I just, I just go to Amazon. I'm like, you know, do you ever go like, like kind of main street in your neighborhood or support local business? They're like, yeah, not, not really. No, nah, it's not for me. 
like you know you just get some of these sort of cues like mm -hmm. okay are, is this person I mean, a, you'd think that the person would kind of put it together a little bit but <laughs> well some don't you know you, you when you them enough, obviously when you let the guard down and you're just we're just here to chat there's you know i'm not i have no influence <laughs> on you whatever you say there's no wrong answers you know yada 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 right and then they're like small businesses i don't have time for that yeah um, you know so so i mean there you know there's sort of those those cues but it's really important because what happens is you you assimilate someone into your culture and they and you want them to to support all of those um, principles that you're your guiding principles you know uh, like don't hire any jerks we used another word for it you know like that was another guiding principle um, you know, I just, we're keeping it, we'll keep it clean here. No, you, you, you can go down any road with us. All right. So, so don't hire any assholes. Right? Exactly. Like that was, that was a guiding principle. Like we needed to make sure. You want to understand that. Don't, don't hire All right. Assholes. Okay. Well, listen, all right, let's go. Uh, gloves are off. Let's go. Uh, I, and then I, there, there are, you know, others, um, you know, be title agnostic. You know, I, we, I, you know, you bring somebody in and you, I'd be interviewing and they're like, well, I don't want anyone. I don't want anyone to come over me between me and the, the, the level I'm going. And I don't want to change my title. Like I want my title to be at least this level. And it's like, who cares what your title is? Like we got to be title agnostic, you know, leave politics at the door, leave, you know, um, cause there's always, you know, folks that are just going to try to be climbing. And, and as, as you grow, you're going to have to bring in new people. And in some of the companies, as we were growing so rapidly, somebody could be a, a individual contributor one day, become like a manager like a month later and become a manager's manager like in two months. Wow. If they're not, if they're not brought into the culture, it won't carry forward to all the, the other people that come in from, from there. And so, so it's just so important to make sure everyone's aligned and, and marching toward, you know, creating frictionless products and services, you know, making sure that, that you know, we're delighting the customer at every turn, reward around the whole company reward everybody for every single day for anything they're doing that that delights the customer and if they see friction in anything we're doing raise your hand speak about it open door policy like all of those things that you know um if you you, you not only just say them but you have to live into it and and make sure that everyone's treated equally and and everyone has a say and everyone can be the boss at the lowest level to the highest level everyone can be a boss and they have a voice and so those things to me are so important uh, because when when the shit hits and it's and like you're it's you're in stress mode or there you know critical things need to be happening for the business to go to to cert, to the next level or we're not going to get funding if we don't do X or we've got to make sure everyone is not you know just going to take their bat and ball and go home yeah. they're going to like roll up their sleeves and do whatever it takes and they're the people you don't have to ask to stay past 5:01 p.m. Mm -hmm. you know and uh, like. You know the mass exodus at you know five five p.m. that you see in. Oh, it's know, usually in, at four fifty nine. Four fifty nine. Yeah. The last house already closing. Yeah. yeah. It's funny because we really like as we've grown probably doubled in the last year. I would say in terms of our size. I mean, you start to feel how the culture can get a little bit lost in the pressure That's of what's right. happening, right? Like yeah. everyone's working so hard, and like you said, like no one really leaves here on time. Although you can start to see some people pulling a bit away. What do you say to like someone who was with you from the start, but now they're not really pulling that culture forward? Do you let them go? Like, where's your sense of loyalty there? Just out of curiosity. Yeah. So, so um, I think, you know, if someone's there from the start, then they've assimilated in, you know, like they, they'll either find their way out or, or realize it's not a fit or, or you would have probably already determined that. So I would, I'm just going on the assumption that if they're there for a long time, they're bought into it, they believe in it. Like, you know, we had, you know, people that were just, you know, even in the earliest days in a couple of the companies were, you know, just like pulling all nighters, you know, on a regular basis. We go right yeah. into the weekends. Like they were sacrificing a lot for the business the, because we didn't, we weren't making them do things. We, were, we, we had some volunteer Saturday days where we would, you know, te testing new, re a new release was going to come out and we we're going to test that on a Saturday when, you know, the, where you know, we'd have less users on, on the platform, for example. And, and we have a full house of people coming in and we, you know, bring in food and, uh, you know, with several of the companies like Constant Contact that you know, I call the Constant Calories because there was just food <laughs> everywhere. It's always like, food. Same with us. There's food it's everywhere. Food. Every, so every break room. And we had, we actually had one guy that did an app, like, you know, to tell you what food, like pizza in kitchen four, you know, <laughs> like 
Uh, you know, so, so, so like You're you didn't miss a beat. <laughs> if you did, if you wanted to, you know, three or four square meals a day, you, you had, you had it. Yeah. So. Yeah, we do a lot of that. We just uh, finished a massive uh, uh, something, jerk chicken Caribbean food lunch just for the whole staff. We, I feel anyways, when everyone's fed and we're eating together, you know, they say if a, a family eats together, you stay together. And so right. this is definitely a family setting around here for us. When, you know, more to Laura's question as well, because I, I, I thought she was going to go one, like a certain direction with it. So, but I wanted to add, add to it because I'm, I'm actually wondering, but not only when you do, you have somebody who's like been with you for a while and if they decide to stay or not stay. What I'm finding sometimes difficult, Alec, is, is when I hire newer people, the guys and gals that have been with me for a while, they got a lot of time with me. And so I was able to spend 10 hours, 12 hours. In fact, the table that we're doing this podcast on, you know, we would have four or five chairs around here. Now there's more people. I, it, it is a little bit more difficult for me to spend that much time that I did with, 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 with some of the people that were here originally. How did you navigate through that? Yeah, and so so uh, some of it, some you know, so as a founder on a lot of companies, you know, and when we talk about title agnostic, I mean, one other point to make is that stay in your lane. Like I knew what I was really good at, you know, um, and I would I would oversee a lot of things early on, and then peel off pieces that you know bring in the experts. Like, I don't, you know, and so so some of that is that was on me, you know, and, and in other cases it moved on to others to to so that everyone got that time with you know, someone in senior management and, and I, you know, and I was always um, of the school to move aside, you know, if, 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 a, if investor comes in and they want adult supervision, fine, you know, that's cool. We'll bring someone in to be CEO. And, and if they've got chops in, in what we're doing or have experience in, in, you know, uh, IPO or acquisition or whatever, great, you know, like step aside, let them do that, you know? And, and so I think, again, part of the culture is that that's the, that's, that, that's part of the, the part of growth, but at the same time, I've always I always made it a point to have an open door, and 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 we always did skip level stuff, you know, formally. So so you would meet with um, not your boss, but your boss's boss, and so we did a lot of skip level, or we do group lunches or new new employee lunches, you know, where we take you know take folks out, and and just try to get as much face time as we we could. You know, you may not be able to do everything individually, but you can certainly do some group based things and. We did a lot of socializing, a lot of, you know, a lot of lunch and learns, a lot of things, you know, with, with several different companies to just give face time with people and, and give people the opportunity to grow within. And so, so we have, um, I loved, you know, in, in uh, two, two stats, I'll give you. So Constant Contact, when we, we went public and then we sold the company, um, when we sold the company, we had 1,500 employees and over half of those employees came from referrals of other employees. Right. Wow. So if someone loved working there so much, half of the people came from, you know, in some cases we had this bloodline of like 10, 10 or 15 kids that went to, you know, that went to college together that, you know, that, that then joined the company. Um, and then we had, you know, we had a lot of promotions and growth within the company. And I don't remember the exact percent, but people would move from one department to another department. So they would go to lunch and learns. They were, we were open door policy, allowed them to meet to go to go inquire about positions in other areas. And we had some people that were skipping around within. So we, we were giving them as much opportunity to grow as they wanted to grow within the company and not, it may not be in the, in the, the, the track of the, the job that they started with. Many switched to other, other areas for their growth. Now, wh when do you know, or when did you know, like, especially when the fact that you got to 1500 so mass like congratulations and kudos on all the success if we didn't mention that already when did you know it was right to to start to scale out and, and and start to hire more people like what was it because you were like right to the brink of bursting, uh, at, the bursting at the seams or was it okay you know what i want to grow now and and I, I i'm gonna be hiring people even before i start bursting at the seams yeah, and so so um, I think I think you, you divide that and the answer to two parts. The first part is uh, required positions that are that are non-starter, right? So so if you're gonna if you're if you're gonna have a growth spurt or a seasonality means like that this next season it's gonna be there's gonna be a a bump up of some percent of business, then you've got to make sure you've got the people positioned to to uh, extra people to fulfill the requirement. 
there's those, those are episodic and and you know planned for and they're okay. not on the, they're non negotiables like there's certain positions where if you're sitting there saying okay we have budget for hiring five people if three of them are in the non negotiable category well then they're automatic now we have we can hire two more like there isn't this trade off to say well should we sacrifice well everyone could take a you know another 50 calls each a day or or you know right. the engineers can just you know work you know on an, another project than what they're doing today like there's some things you just you just realize that you you have to grow and that's that's a function of getting ahead of kind of the spurt uh, of uh, customer service and 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 you know uh, uh, operations and certain things and then other positions are more uh, you know kind of are are planned for to help with with kind of getting on the you know cut, uh, planning for that growth in terms of you know, new uh, building out new features or whatever they may be focused on that that aren't time sensitive to the business growth as much as they right. are to the the growth of the bu the business. Um, you know, from a product perspective. I, I want to jump back to something that you said earlier, like when you were thinking about, like the, you you understood that you might not have gotten paid for six months, even if the company, let alone, was going to be around. I, Jazz is trying to figure out how to not pay people. <laughs> well, pay you specifically. It's, yeah, this, this is really it. more for you. Yeah, so so um, we're going to have a conversation about how, if you. Uh, cool. So we're going to determine by the end of this whether whether Laura gets paid or not. Is that yeah, that's exactly I'm, I'm that's exactly where it's going. All right, so all right, so. All right. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I talk to a lot of people through my social media content, the importance of, look, there, you, you, if you're looking for a job or you're looking for a role in a company, yes, you can send out a bunch of resumes and that's a great start. But I think to, to fast track that, something that maybe the younger generation can do, and it doesn't matter really what age you are, but you can, because when you're younger, you might not have as many bills, monthly bills. That, that, that you're committed to, but to actually go and work for free. And I'm not talking to somebody who is very skillful at something, they're, they're well off. I'm not telling you to work for free to somebody who's watching or listening, but if you're wanting to get into a company, like just get started, like get your foot in the door and, and coming from you. And sometimes, some, sometimes people just need to hear it from a different source uh, because my voice they're getting tired of now, but like, what's your thoughts around that? Obviously, you did it, but now that you have so much more experience, like, are you happy that you did it? Do you tell people, like, listen, get started, just work for free, like, get coffees if that's what you need to do. Not to say, like, only go to a place where you're only going to be getting coffees all day, but hopefully you're in an organization where you can learn and maybe you might have to get coffees. Yeah, so so maybe I uh, qualifying the question. Um, so there's the difference between a, uh, somebody who's joining a startup where they yeah. may be not, they may be knowing no no money, you know, but but they're going to go build build it to a point and then go get funding, versus you know sort of going to something that's a bit more established. Um, and and so so is someone you know a risk taker and willing to you know uh, uh, hedge the bet if you you know you join a startup then you know there's there you know there's uh, you know, equity options, you know, there, there's an opportunity for, for greater upside. Right. And sometimes that's tra trading that off where you might take a cut in salary or maybe no salary. And I've done this several times where I've taken no salary. And so uh, I'll just, you know, this is just a side funny story for a second. But when I joined, you know, uh, so I teamed up with the, uh, the two other founders of Constant Contact. You know, the three of us were going to, we're in an attic and we we're going to get going. And we were not taking salary. Now I'm just paint the picture. I had some success prior with some other exits, uh, so no salary. But so I have three mortgages. You know, I've got all I've got all the bills you can imagine, um, and and I'm not going to be taking any salary. And so so I'm talking to my mom, and you know, I said, well, I've got this opportunity, and you know, really excited about you know uh, what we're working what we're working on, and we've talked to our target market, and they're wide eyed with you know what we can do for them, and really excited. She's like, well, you know, they're paying you. I'm like. Well, we're not paying ourselves because we don't have any. We don't have any money. We don't have any. Yeah. We don't have any customers. We don't have any revenue. We don't have any money. And she's like, if I heard it, you know, ten times, that was a, a too few. You know, you're <laughs> you know, you're going to go bankrupt. You know, like how could you? You know, how irresponsible. You're going to be eating into your savings. You know, this like blah blah blah. Ten years later, we go public, and who on Facebook in all caps wrote, "I always knew it would be a success." That's mom. <laughs> That's mom for you, yeah. Hey, we gotta love mom. Yeah. Oh yeah. So so and of course, you know, eight years later we sell for one point one billion. And she asked, she asked me if that was a typo. 
yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but so, so, um, you know, if you, if you're passionate about, uh, about, uh, an idea, you have an idea or you're teaming up with others cause there's this great idea, you know, you, you see there's a big market opportunity. There's a, there's a big problem there. It's not really being solved well by others and you want it, you want to jump in and you can make your mark. You have an opportunity for greater upside with equity and, and, and eventually once funding comes in, you know, people will get paid. Maybe, maybe you get, you get less lower in market taking a chance on, on the equity. And so the first time that I did that, I left a very, very lucrative position of nine years with a big book of business to go to somewhere to take a cut and pay, but I got equity. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in five years, when I realized what it, when we went public, what that piece of paper was worth, then it's, I said to myself, okay, this is why, this is why I, all the, those sacrifices that I made, you know, I, you know, I had friends that were buying the boats and buying the fancy cars and whatever. And I was, I wasn't, you know, my, I was hunkering down to, to, you know, to, to join a startup and take a chance. Right. You know? And I and so, buy those things cash if you wanted to. That's right. I, or, <laughs> uh, yeah. Or buy the dealership. You know? I love that. <laughs> I love that. In terms of like for, for our viewers and listeners, um, Alec, you've been very humble um, because I, like, I'm not sure if people have caught it, but you've taken companies public, you've had some massive exits and you've kind of glazed over that. But I make sure, I want to make sure that the viewers and listeners know who we're in the presence of. Oh, uh, Jazz, you're a listener. Yeah. No, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, like, I would be remiss. And I think my viewers and listeners and Laura and I would get a lot of messages and be like, guys, you guys like, can you ask them this question, which is where do you see some white space, some opportunity right now for possible you know call it startups or or maybe it's a technology technology uh, technology play maybe it's just a customer service play because it could be either or or some type of business where do you see some some white space yeah so uh and one thing i would just just on what you said i want to make a quick comment and then i'll answer it um you know as far as uh you know i, I will never sit here and take credit for for yeah. the success that i've had because because it takes a village right? We, it takes a team, you know, in the case of constant contact, um, you know, we had an amazing management team. We had 1500 employees, you know, uh, we, you know, uh, 10 years to the day we go public and then we sell when we sold, we had 1500 employees, 750,000 paying customers, uh, paying an average of $42 a month. So it's about $450 million business. We had 8,000 partners that were on any given day were promoting us to, to our target audience, you know, we, we use your service for a very, very, very long time. God. So to 750, 749,999 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> plus you. Yes. Plus, plus you. you. So thank you for that. Uh, we yes. appreciate, we appreciate the, uh, and if you were a paying customer, thank you even more. We definitely um, were. Definitely okay. Were. Then, then we can keep talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so the bottom line is that, that, um, you know, uh, we, we, you know, we, it, the credit goes to, to everyone. Like I'm a, I'm an idea guy and I, and I see, see opportunities. Um, I've created some amazing things that have, have been, have been life changing. And so, you know, so technology, you may not see that as much, but, but when I can walk down, I'm in Boston, Massachusetts, I can walk down our Newberry street, the next street over, which is our shopping district street. And they knock on the windows and wave or come out and give me a treat or, uh, like, you know, the bakery wants to give me like, you know, uh, like a cupcake or something, or they call me in to want to chat or, you know, or introduce me to somebody like, you know, like the feeling, I just got the chills of knowing that we were helping so many small businesses on Main Street, you know, and, and, and succeeding in, in, in their business, you know, that I, I wouldn't trade that for anything. And I go around the world speaking and I go onto Main Street, wherever I am in the world, um, and, uh, and I'll, I'll talk to small businesses and ask them, what are you doing about marketing? And half the time they're, they were, you know, they are a customer of, of constant contact. And, and I just, you know, I, and they get a kick out of it. I get a kick out of it. And, and just to offer them some tips or suggestions from, from, you know, having a quick conversation. And, and I, I love that. I, anything to, you know, anything to help the, you know, the, that, that feel good. So I think it's, so I think it's really, really important. Um, uh, the second thing is that, um, you know, I live by my, my, my mantras, you know, accomplishments are something to build on, not rest on. 
Mm. Right. So I tried retirement uh, for about six months, maybe, and was bored out of my mind and then quadrupled down. I'm now co-founder of four different companies that are, we have an innovation think tank. We're spin, spinning out new products that are disrupting billion dollar markets like and I and, and it's not me. There's a there's eight of us and there's my two co-founders are rock star mechanical engineers. We have a manufacturing facility. We're making products, physical products. Uh, I can show you. I'll show you yeah, one. Sure. Uh, if you want a quick. So, so this, if this is your standard kind of walking cane. Mm -hmm. Yep. I don't have to describe that, but this was never really disrupted, but the, the Reacher Grasper is concealed inside. Oh, I need one. <laughs> yeah, so, so if you can't, if you're, if you're vertically challenged, you know, you can get stuff off of higher shelves. Yeah. Yeah, I, actually, I just bought one not that long ago. It wasn't a cane, but luckily, it had the thing on the Luckily, hubby's <laughs> six something. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so you got to pair yourself with someone who can get the high, the high items off the shelf. But so, so this is taking two markets, you know, that, that hadn't been disrupted. Like, you know, that, that, that aluminum cane with the gray handle that we all see everyone walking around with, or, you know, there's a couple that have come out since that are a little bit more modernized, but um, and then the grasper is pancaking and it doesn't really pick stuff up. And it, this grasp like your hand, you know, can hold up to five pounds of weight. Wow. And so it gives somebody their mobility and their independence and convenience back when they're not walking, you know, room to room carrying a cane and a grasper or leaving the home with both. No one takes the grasper with them. And my mom's a perfect example, had knee replacements, uh, got, go, goes to the car, tries to get her keys out of a bag that she would have won everything on the price is right because that bag had everything in there i'm like mom do you have a paper clip mom you know do you have a stapler mom you know do you have a shredder what do you got in that bag yeah. but but she she drops her keys and she has to wait she doesn't have her phone she forgets her phone so she's standing by her car waiting for 20 minutes for someone to come to Aww. pick the keys up to give them to her well of course the, with with the the reacher grasper cane it's a it's a combo she could have picked it up right away and go on her and gone on her way so 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 there are tons of opportunities for disrupting existing right. markets. So I look for those and I've, we've found four, four different areas where we're, we've built products that we've brought out, we've tested and, and, and have had success. As far as opportunities for folks uh, outside of that, the, you know, now the you know, real, real estate and alternative investments in real estate are incredible. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot, like I, I'm in RV parks, you know, we're dropping in RV parks uh, in a 600 mile strip of roadway in the 300 mile mark, put another RV park and make it a 10 star tricked out, nicest thing you've ever seen. A little car, RV you know, resort. Do it, at, do it on the water where there's cottages where they can check, you know, check in with the RV and then, then check in again into a cottage on the water. And, you know, and so I've just been an, an investor in some, some interesting things because there's tons of alternative investment opportunity and of course, then, you know, asking everyone to like a side hustle. I've been involved with um, a couple of things on the direct selling side that, that are amazing products with, with great companies that, that afford people that extra, the extra income on a, you know, kind of that monthly basis to whatever level, however much time you want to put in, you, you get back in return, you know, with, with, um, with, with some money. And so, so I've just filled the gaps, if you will, in my own personal portfolio of looking for things that are alternative and, and some things I'm, you know, doubling down and, you know, funding, you know, as uh, innovation think tank to fund our own companies. And in other cases, you know, I'm investing in, in both tech and non-tech, you know, for, uh, for in many different, uh, different areas, but there's a lot just kind of, as we come out of this you know, current market condition, there'll be a lot of room for growth and opportunity. Yeah. So Alec, a lot, obviously, a lot of our listeners learn a lot from hearing about uh, people we have on about their successes. I was wondering if you can kind of go back in time a little bit and maybe draw on one of your failures or, or a learning opportunity and, and provide that to our listeners. Um, yeah, so so I'd love to. I, did, I don't have a specific. Uh, I've had uh, spot failures in every situation, and we've righted the ship. So, so uh, thankfully, I'm finding some wood. So we're gonna knock. Um, I got, I got that for you. <laughs> yeah, we got a knock on that table for me. Thank you. Um, uh, but but I, I think I would love to answer that a little bit more. Uh, not skating the question, but I want to answer it a little bit more generally. The, um, obstacles are the thing that uh, in most cases will uh, be the stuck point of businesses failing, especially startups, right? How to handle obstacles. And I think one of the most important things 
that I, I didn't know and really learn early enough, but I do know now and I know it well, is that you've got to create the muscle memory to deal with those obstacles. So the first thing about an obstacle, it's if you don't, like if you were like me, you walk into the, you, know, you get your clipboard or your piece of paper and you write the obstacle on the first line and you put a little box next to it and you hope you check it by the end of the day and you don't. You go to the next day, it's there again. You write it again on a new piece of paper. Like, you know, you're just avoiding it. Um, so the first thing is just, uh, you've got to stop that and you've got to go seek counsel because you're not the first one having the obstacle. <laughs> so who, who tackled it and, and knocked it down before successfully, who failed at knocking it down, right? And then you, you'll, you'll, um, you'll get the learnings from that. Can it be broken down into smaller pieces, smaller wins to, to chunk it up and knock it down pieces of it? Because you've got to develop that muscle memory to knock down that obstacle. Because the minute you do, behind it is a bigger one. Mm. And this is no, this is a fact. And you're growing your like business. You get, <laughs> it, really you get, yeah, if you got a lot of them, that's whack-a-mole. Yeah. But yeah. Um, no, don't be hitting each other. This is a game that you hit the board. You know, I, I, I did once. We were whacking each other once. Yeah. I know the feeling. So, so the bottom line is you want to, you know, you've got to knock that down because then the one behind it's bigger. You got to knock that one down and one behind that's bigger and you get that muscle memory going. And I think handling of obstacles, knocking those things down are critical. And that becomes the fear and the stuck point for a lot of companies or startups anyway. And, and founders who are like, you know what, I'm taking my bat and ball. I'm going home. I, I, I can't. I can't. This is too much for me. And, and in anything in life and in business, you, you're going to have obstacles and it's how you deal with them. So for me, that was one of the most incredible kind of eye-opening experiences to figure that out and then realize I'm not alone, I'm not first, and really take advantage of seeking counsel and, and finding the ways to knock those down and do, do it with humor, because some of the worst, worst scenarios, I always try to find laughter and everything, uh, get those endorphins going and then sit and figure out how to solve it. We kind of, we are saying around here is you have to build up those calluses, right? So it yeah. might hurt while it's happening. It's not always pleasurable, but in the end, uh, you're going to be much better off. So that's great advice. Well, we're, we're, we're definitely better off because of you joining us on today's uh, podcast. So we really appreciate it. We also, hopefully for the viewers and listeners, you, you, you come up with now reasons why why you should get started if you're thinking about starting a business starting to invest into real estate understand and i think alec and laura you'll, you'll, you'll both agree because we've lived it we experienced it that everyone was scared until they did it and and and, and then you start to realize over time that you just really need to see that first step it's, you don't need to see the whole staircase and if you can just take the first step the counsel, I loved what you said, go seek counsel, reverse engineer what somebody else has done really well so we don't have to hit our head against the wall. Right, yeah, and, and, and mentorship is the, the other key in that. Um, you know, just, just surround yourself with others. Um, I, I would, you know, starting different businesses, I sought out the two or three people that I, would be the rock stars that, that if we had them involved in any way as advisor or mentor or whatever, and I went and found them. And if I didn't know them directly, I went through my network a degree or two away, someone knew them. And I, I would get it. to that, I would get to that person and, and lo, next thing you know, they're, they're advising us and mentoring us. So, so seek, seek out those that, that have been there, done that and succeeded and are failed and can teach, can teach you as a mentor. Now, Alec, what is the best place for people to find you, get in touch with you, learn more about you? Where, where's the, the one, two, three places, please, like, Feel sure. free to share all the links okay. and, and, and my guys and gals will make sure that it goes in below here in the episode to, uh, descriptions. Yeah. So the, so uh, the first is uh, my website, which is Alec Speaks, A-L-E-C-S-P-E-A-K-S, alecspeaks.com. Uh, your microphone over your shoulder is, uh, is uh, the old Elvis mic is my, uh, is my logo. I like that. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so alecspeaks.com. And then I'm also uh, uh, partnered and co-hosted in us a, uh, a great summit for, for entrepreneurs and, and, um, and startups uh, called the, the Stimulus Summit, Think, Start, Scale. And so we've got a whole lineup of 21 amazing rock star founders and household name product, you know, uh, com companies that, that are sharing their 
uh, you know, kind of the behind the scenes, a little bit of the backstory, but also really about, you know, their experiences. So the, stim the stimulus summit.com. If anyone wants to, is that to an online uh, check it out, is it, it's going to be like an online conference now. Yeah. So, so it's a 21 day, 21 day conference. It's an hour a day starts wow. uh, September 14th and uh, the best of the best uh, lineup of, uh, of speakers that uh, will be kicking off next week. Well, phenomenal and congratulations. And thank you so much for joining us today, Alec. Oh, my pleasure. And uh, anytime uh, you want me uh, to join you for your Caribbean lunches or, or just, just to hang out and chit chat, I'm, I'm, I'm available. Well, we really appreciate that. And when things start to open up again, if you come to Toronto and you don't look us up or shoot us a message, we, we right. will definitely be insulted because we would love to show you around Toronto. Not that I you love, I love, it, I've been, I, I spent quite a bit of time in my career in Toronto. I do love it, but, and I hope to get back to there soon and I will definitely reach out. Well, we have a massive tech sector growing here, one of the fastest in North America. So we're very excited about that. Uh, but again, thank you so much, Alan. All right. My pleasure. Thank you, guys.